Welcome to Free Thoughts, a new project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm a research fellow here at the Cato Institute and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris. I'm a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. For this first episode of Free Thoughts, we want to look at politics and community and the relationship between them. Libertarians often get called anti-community. That's an unfair charge, of course. But it's a plausible one if you assume no difference between community and politics, between community and the state. This mistake is in fact a rather common one and thus results in many bad arguments against libertarianism. So what is community? And what is politics? And can we have one without the other? So Trevor, let's maybe start by defining our terms here. Um, most people, I think, have a good sense of what community means, but we can we can get to that one. But let's start let's start with politics. Like when we talk about politics and we contrast it with community or compare it to community, what what do we mean by that? Well, generally, we're talking about some method. Uh, we, you know, there's a lot of whether it's dictatorship or anything like that. But in, we just can stick, I would say, to modern political philosophy. Some method by which. Uh, a group of people enact control. It's usually voting over other people in the in the area. It's it's to, it's not voluntary. That's first of all clear. It's not all voluntary. No, and I think I think the voluntary is that's the really important issue here, uh, and that's where we start to really distinguish politics from community. I I wrote a post for libertarianism dot org this week where I said that politics is is basically we start with with discourse with group decision making. Um, so we're, you know, we, we vote on something and people agree to go along with it or not, and that happens all the time in our daily lives. I mean, you get together with a bunch of friends and say, let's pick a restaurant to go out to, and some people, you know, I want to go for Chinese and everyone else wants to go for Italian, so we decide to go for Italian. But that's that's not politics, even though it looks a lot like the stuff that goes on. It looks a lot like voting. That the difference is you add. And the winners get to back up their position with violence or the threat of violence. Ultimately violence. You could also – you could go I guess a little bit above violence. We might be going – maybe some people would think we're going hyperbolic. Violence is part of the equation. We might just want to say that that the losers view it as legitimate that they have to comply with the winners. That's one thing. That's one function of democracy that, that – and, and a mini dispute resolution that if you lose if you lose the game if you lose a dispute you abide by the results still um, and and then if those who don't most people voluntarily ab- abide by the results of democracy um, and if you don't though there is a, a threat of force to back it up. But isn't that 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 sense of needing to abide applies even in the non political examples of the say going out to the restaurant that if we all say we're going to go to a restaurant tonight at eight and We'll decide when we get together. The the losers, so to speak, in that case, still probably feel like you know they're not going to say, "Well, then I'm just going to head off on my own and go to that other restaurant I wanted to anyway." Generally speaking, and that would be against social convention, but they don't have to, right? Right, and so I think I think the have to is where for I mean we we're taught that we should, and we we internalize this notion, but ultimately that what sets politics apart from all the other things. Um, even other things where we have a really strong sense that we ought to abide by the decision is that in the political arena, there is this specter of violence out there that if you don't if if the society decides that everyone's house has to look a certain way and you don't want to paint your house that way and you refuse, you get fined. And if you don't pay the fine, then they'll come and threaten you or garnish your wages or whatever else. And if you, still refuse to pay it, then they'll come and try to arrest you. And if you resist arrest, you get violence. Exactly. And that is um, that. That is a very good touchstone for why politics is something very different than community. <clears throat> you don't have that in your, your going to dinner example or even necessarily in a gated community. Uh, a gated community can bring force upon people, but it can't make you live there. You could say that the state can't make you live in the state, but that gets a little bit uh, difficult for something you've been born into and, and everything around you. All your friends, they all live there. You'd like to stay there. Uh, and of course, the violence is, is the crucial thing. And that <clears throat> gets us to the, uh, the the definition of the state that is most often li- used by libertarians and non-libertarians, which is the, the 
holder of the a monopoly on violence within a geographic location. Right, or legitimate violence, legitimate because there are violence. lots of people who engage in violence within a state, but yeah. the state claims that it's the only one who may legitimately do so, that it's not wrong when it mm-hmm. this, when It's it not a it. mob shakedown operation or something like that. It's a legitimate community-oriented, at least that's the theory, uh, method of figuring out the things that we have to decide together. And that's, of course, the other thing that comes into this in the in – the, words of people like Elizabeth Warren and Barack Obama uh, pretty recently where where we talk about politics in such a community type of, of link, language where we say, uh, you know, Barack Obama said politics, I think it was, politics is the one thing we all participate in. I don't know if it was politics, but, but government is the one thing we all participate in. And then similarly, we have Elizabeth Warren saying, you know, you didn't build that and, and other people picking up that, that vein of, of discussion to talk about how this integrated whole that we live in where we vote and choose all these things through political methods and then use violence ultimately to enforce that against the people who lose that, that election or decision making, uh, that, that that is some sort of instantiation of, of the general community where we depend upon each other. Yeah, I, the, the point that Elizabeth Warren is making is this kind of gratitude account of why we ought to obey the state and why we ought to pay taxes, which is that you know you you weren't kind of born into a vacuum. You were born into this pre-existing society that had a pre-existing amount of stuff, resources, services, all of that, and that because those things were either in some cases provided by the government or supported by the government in some way, and that that government is is us. It's you know. It's us coming together. It's us paying for these things via taxes. That anything that you, any goods you derived from using these things you found in the environment, so the education you got going to the schools, the places you were able to go driving on the roads, whatever else, to some level you owe everyone else for that. And because the government is everyone else in this view, you owe the government. Mm -hmm. And so then you're then obligated to both obey the government, respect its laws so that it doesn't have to use violence against you, and to continue to pay for these services, to kind of pay it forward. Mm-hmm. As much as the community uh, demands, I guess. I don't know if Elizabeth Warren would draw an upper line of, for example, progressive tax date, taxation if that was your fee for for you know becoming a millionaire because you use roads and schools. But aside from that, I think that it's interesting to take the uh, what I what I have called and, and I and what we have called together extremification of the of the conversation. So the counterpoint to and we're recording this during the government shutdown, so we're hearing a lot of discussions of you know anarchists. I'm making scare quotes there, uh, Tea Party people, and then uh, not people who want to keep the government running. And the Tea Party people are against community and against government. This kind of rhetoric. So the counterpoint to the Elizabeth Warren, Barack Obama, we're all in this together, government is what we do all together, uh, is the idea of the atomistic individual who apparently, or at least in terms of the straw man argument, denies that fact totally and thinks that men are islands. I I think that's sort of a a caricature we get a lot. Yeah, we get it it quite often. It's probably the – that – that's probably the most common one next to maybe we're selfish and greedy and just want to get whatever is ours at the expense of everyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, although the two are very related in this kind of straw man picture of libertarianism. In fact, that that particular charge has shown up quite recently in several attacks against libertarianism published. So there was uh, Peter Corning publishing in Psychology Today – wrote a piece on called, I believe, What's the Matter with Libertarians or What's the Matter with Libertarianism? Uh, and he he said that, quote, the more radical versions of libertarianism rely on a terminally deficient model of human nature and society. And he adds, we evolved as intensely interdependent social animals. So keep in mind, this is what he's saying. This is what he's saying is the real model that, that libertarians Deny, reject. Yeah. Um, So he says that the real model is we evolved as intensely interdependent social animals and our sense of empathy towards others, our sensitivity to reciprocity, our desire for inclusion and the loyalty to the groups we bond with, the intrinsic satisfaction we derive from cooperative activities 
and our concern for having the respect and approval of others all evolved in humankind to temper and constrain our individualistic selfish impulses. Mm-hmm. So there there you've got that. In a in another one called Libertarians Are the New Communists, an op-ed published in Bloomberg by Nick Hanauer and Eric Liu, they said radical libertarianism assumes that humans are wired only to be selfish when in fact cooperation is the height of human evolution. These these quotes, when you look at them, they, they strike me as really interesting. We, we could have discussions about how much – let's just take the welfare state. I mean, there's so many other things we could talk about it, and, but the welfare state is, is always a big one. And, and we have these people uh, advocating for forced welfare payments, right? And saying, and apparently, I would assume, not believing that voluntary welfare parent payments, uh, charity, private charity, would do the job. Yeah, uh, because we should, we should be clear: what they're not when they talk about we are libertarians or these radical individualists and selfish and whatever else. They're not. They're not saying libertarians are going out there and violating basic rights in order to get what they want. They're not saying, well, libertarians are these are, are muggers and are out there stealing from people. Well, they and, might think that about businessmen or something like that. Sure, yeah. but I mean we're talking like like Normal, genuine yeah. muggers on the street. Like that's not what they're saying we are. What they're the reason that they are saying these things about us is because we are rejecting certain ways of interacting with and in their minds helping other people. Exactly. And so so if we the welfare state, if, we, if if they apparently think people need to be coerced into providing welfare and we think that people can be pretty good at providing charity by themselves, you have to kind of ask who is actually thinking people are selfish, right? Um, we, we, we need to have, you know, temper and constrain our individual selfish impulses. Uh, we have uh, – we are – that we are wired to be selfish when, in fact, cooperation is the height of human evolution. But they need to make people, through force, behave the way that they are saying people are anyway. There's a, there's a little bit that, that, that people are so cooperative, but they're not cooperative enough for us. Apparently, is it possible though that their argument is with a certain type of utopian thinking that they see libertarians as engaging in? Because if if we replaced all coerced welfare system, um, welfare programs with totally voluntary, like private charity. So right now, everyone pays taxes in some form or another, and and por- a portion of each person's taxes goes towards these social welfare programs. And let's assume that it then is just dispersed to people who need it. There aren't these inefficiencies. Yeah, so there's it's just, no, there's it's, no noise in the system. Right, it's perfect. just going. Um, then, then under this coercion, everyone is participating in providing welfare for the needy. If we got, if we went to a strictly voluntary system, many people would continue to give, just as many people right now give to charities. But it is the case that fewer people would give mm-hmm. yes. in a voluntary system. Yeah, that would just be an economic calculation. Uh, your marginal person would stop giving. There are people who are really into giving to charity and there are people who are less into giving to charity. So those people would stop giving. And that's always a question of, of economics uh, in terms of how much private charity would result. But in terms of it being a question of community and whether or not uh, you know we're uh, – Against community, we go back to you know this question of whether or not these mechanisms that uh, politically choose welfare recipients, politically choose uh, everything from schools, uh, the quality, of the nature and quality of our schools, the curriculum of our schools, any of these things we do we decide about. Uh, well, I, I, I should put we in quotation marks again. Any any of these things, some people who vote decide about are in fact community and to deny that is atomistically individualistic. And I think that's interesting uh, just in terms of a broader debate that has been happening in political philosophy for I would say a couple centuries now, which is a slow erosion of the private sphere in order to make it public. And, And that's when they're sort of denying that there's atomistic individuals. They have to say, well, you're not really all on your own. Uh, you 
you affect things outside of your private sphere and things outside of your private sphere affect you. Uh, one of the things that you know strikes me about that is uh, feminists have brought this point up a lot. They say that the private sphere, uh, you know, keeping it private, allowing husbands to beat their wives as, as was possibly the case in some places in the 19th century and allowing different types of oppression to go on inside the home leaks to the outside of the home area and perpetuates the oppression of females in the broader sense. So this idea that there is no such thing as, as private, right, there, that all things are ultimately political and uh, and the government has jurisdiction over over all these areas that are private to your, your personal life, property, and individual let me ask, just stepping back and going back to the, the violence issue, because we've gone into community. I want to talk about what the, these different conceptions of community, like what the libertarian view of community actually looks like and how it relates to politics. But the, the question of violence here, we, we often – I mean when we call something violence, there's, there's a sense in which all violence is illegitimate, mm-hmm. right? That it's not, it's not acceptable to engage in violence. And so does – a presumption, that, at least. Yeah. So, so is that actually the case? Like, do we have to? Is there a place for violence within politics, or is there, so? I guess is there a place for politics? Uh, that is. I mean, that's the uh, the way this should be considered. Uh, that you know, I'm not. I'm not an anarchist, and I'm not. I find. I think about where politics should be in a place, and I kind of think about this. Um, Best represented is sort of where our Venn diagrams most overlap, um, in a, in a, and that's the way I, I sort of think about it. If you think about everyone's uh, preferences and, uh, for various things, and where the Venn diagrams most overlap uh, is the place where politics is better suited for decision making. Um, and so some of those that are con- that are mentioned, and we believe here at Cato, like strong national defense, for example, has far more overlapping. Uh, agreement on on where we should be using politics to decide these things, uh, what, where we have schooling, for example, uh, and how people should be taught, how children should be taught, uh, also uh, pr- what substances should be prohibited, uh, a ton of how our healthcare programs should look. You start having just very little overlap, and and you can tell that when you start hearing rhetoric that's incredibly vague, like everyone needs to be taken care of and in, in their healthcare needs. Uh, that that explains a lot of different opinions about what healthcare needs are, um, and so that would be my general, uh, you know, very inexact theory of where politics is best suited is where we we agree on more things. But even even still, there's going to be some areas where even agreement isn't necessary for violence or politics to be justified. So if we if we have a set of basic rights. So a right not to be assaulted and murdered, a right not to have our property stolen, those rights don't depend on agreement. Like, they don't, no. Um, and, and yet violence is permissible around those rights in the sense that if you violate my rights or you're going to violate one of those rights or you're coming at me mm-hmm. with a knife, I am allowed to engage in – Yes, violence to defend myself. Yeah, and it's not it's not the the agreement that makes them makes violence permissible. It's the underlying source of the agreement. I would say so. Uh, the desire to not have our stuff stolen is a very very widely shared des, you know desire. But that's not why it's justified. Violence is justified to prevent that. It's not the agreement. It's the fact that having our stuff stolen is a violation of right. Uh, and th- that's the core reason. But again, that gets you to what the meaning of like um, minimally normative state, which is sort of what a Hayekian term would be, um, or, or just a minimal government that, that protects life, liberty, property. Um, th- those are sort of descriptions of things that have very, very wide agreement on where politics is less pernicious to community in those areas. And, and this has been discussed in political philosophy for, for centuries. And, and in the 20th century, both John Rawls, who is sort of the, the torchbearer of modern liberalism, 
and then also Friedrich Hayek, who is a, a very big fan. We're very big fans of Hayek at Cato. Both of them talked about you know sort of overlapping social consensus and Rawls in terms of the things everyone agrees that are minimally needed, and also Hayek's point about minimal normative, normativity for where the state should control where we can community create a community out of politics better than in more specific things. And I mean, I'm not saying anything different than right now is like. Uh, think of the disagreements that would arise if we tried to vote about de- decorating our houses. And those disagreements, that's very maximally normative. Those, dem- those disagree- disagreements arise because we have a lot of very different opinions about how to decorate our houses, and they aren't violations of right, and they don't. And so the Venn diagrams are just scattered, and they rarely overlap. And, uh, but in terms of basic violation of property rights, uh, we have a, a lot of agreement on. And I think this gets to where our differences are with these these quotes that I read earlier with the, the conception of community and politics that's expressed in those is we see far from saying denying politics or denying the expansiveness of politics or wanting to scale politics back, far from saying that that is somehow corrosive of community. Um, that, that the, you know if we shrink the state, we, it means we're necessarily anti-community. We, in fact, tend to argue that the more politics you have, the less genuine and effective and well-functioning a community will be. Mm -hmm. And much of that is for exactly these reasons, is that a community – in order for a community to really work, in order for us to feel like a part of it and get a lot out of it, which is enormously important for us and we we need to be part of these social relationships in order to be happy, uh, that there has to be a level of – trust Mm -hmm. and we can't feel threatened Mm -hmm. by the people around us. And so if we're using politics to decide all of these questions like how are we going to decorate our house, but also ones that are more important to us. I mean, how you decorate a house actually is important to a lot of people, but things like how do we educate our children? um, what, What sorts of ways do we address health concerns? How do we religious questions, all these other things, the more that those are determined by the political process... The more it separates us. Yeah, it makes... It turns it turns people who would be members of the same community with differences. So you can decorate your house however you want, and I can decorate my house however I want, we want, but we can be really good neighbors still. Mm-hmm. It, it starts pushing us in the direction of being enemies. Mm-hmm. Because if you get your way, it means that I don't get mine. And if if what we're arguing about is something that's really important to me and to my sense of purpose and, and the direction I want my life to take, then you're doing real damage to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I've described this. Uh, I mean, it's I guess it's somewhat of a, a little bit of a joke, but I, I have an essay on the Libertarians.org site called "The Problem of People Liking Different Things," and it's just it, it it is only a problem under certain circumstances. So it's not a problem, you know, that someone listening to this likes. Uh, Mexican mariachi music, and I don't, generally speaking, it is a problem if that is suddenly politicized. And suddenly the fact that the guy who likes Mexican mariachi music and, and me, we can we can hang out together and, and, and be friends. But as soon as, as I'm starting to try to impose my music taste on him or, or vice versa, it suddenly is very anti-community. And this is, you can analyze a lot of political theory just to say, you know, uh, that person likes different things and I think the fact that they like those things is bad, and I want to take control over them, whether it's they like SUVs um, or they like corporate products or things that destroy the environment, which which on some basic level just means that they don't have the same preference for the environment as you do. And so now it's just a question of whose preference for the environment wins out. Although to be fair, there there are instances where – their lack of preference for the environment could yes. be a legitimate threat. To Absolutely. If they're, if they're dumping waste into mm-hmm. the groundwater where you get your water, that could be very harmful yes. to you. And those are and those are difficult questions that, that we talk about here at Cato all the time and the best way of solving those. But you need to come up with some story like that, generally speaking. I, mean, I mentioned these private spheres you know, a few minutes ago about you know the, the erosion of the private sphere and getting into them to say you're, you're causing harm. Uh, and you 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 have this question, like for example, in environmental regulation, where no, your your pollution is leaking outside of your private sphere. Uh, we're going to regulate that. But generally speaking, private spheres are very like respected. Private spheres are very good ways of letting people live together 
uh, in a in a community oriented way, in a good fences make good neighbors type of way, where we're suddenly all not uh, you have control over your place and I have control over my place, and barring some sort of leakage, that's generally the rule. And now we're not voting on everything under the sun because someone has sort of a just so story about how your music taste or the cigarette smoke that's leaking outside of your house or whatever is causing all these problems. So I need to come into your private sphere and, and regulate it. I think what what's an important point to make here is that in addition to the argument that we make that the bigger politics gets and what we mean again by bigger politics is more decisions in our lives being made via the political process as opposed to being made by us. Um, and, and by us does not mean just radically isolated individuals who are totally uninfluenced by anyone and anything around them because all of us are deeply embedded in cultures and communities and families and networks of friends and they influence the decisions we're going to make and it would be I mean to a large extent impossible to make decisions that weren't influenced in some way by all of that but but those are still those are still voluntary decisions mm-hmm. in the sense that they're not they're not backed up by violence if they're you know they're not being coerced upon us um, but we we argue that 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 as politics grows it degrades meaningful community but it's also the case, and these are, I think, it's a subtle distinction, but they are distinct, that also the smaller politics is. If politics is reduced to just, the state is reduced to just respecting these rights and protecting these fundamental rights, that that will have a huge positive benefit on community. The community will flourish even more than it already is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the people will, will solve things voluntarily. Uh, you have the sort of utopia of utopias idea in Robert Nozick, which is within a minimal state, you ha- you can have a thousand flowers. And a minimal bloom. state is one that limits itself to just protecting these basic rights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and a thousand flowers can bloom about the possibilities of freedom and voluntariness. And that's – that's uh, in, a, in different policy areas, uh, Cato, here, we talk about that in, in different ways. In the education context, we talk about how – uh, the thousand flowers that can bloom or a thousand different types of schools that have different ways of, of educating kids and no one is fighting over you know their their kids education um, uh, and how they want to educate other people's kids in, in, a, in an interesting way that they'll so the left says kids need to learn global warming and environmentalism and the right says they need to learn uh, Christian values and and God and and that creates a lot of strife but they can both have their schools in a minimally normative state in a, in, a, in a night watchman state, if you want to call it, uh, just protecting those basic values. And those communities can be friends in a way that, that they aren't really friends within the political system. And you can still, if you want to, live with people who share your values. You absolutely can. And, and we people see this, do that now. We, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's like cities and towns have a recognizable character that differs from other cities and towns. And that's because people – like to live with other people who share their values and so they start living together and then that place develops a reputation for having a certain sort of community and so people who are attracted to that community move there and all of that happens without these people you know like a given city has a very strong indie music scene Mm -hmm. and people who are into indie rock go there but that that happens without the community voting and saying in this town 85% 85% of the shows that mm-hmm. must be indie rock must shows. be indie rock. It, yeah. it just it happens organically and it, it allows for a much richer, more vibrant culture. And it also happens within larger cities. You'll have neighborhoods that are very distinct in feel. And again, that happens without this – without politics. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, the, the possibilities of community developing just sort of naturally uh, – and then also the ways in which government destroys community. I think it seems it seems clear to me now, of course I'm biased, but it seems clear to me that if you look at the, the sort of ways in which government destroys community, and we've talked about some of them, such as voting on education, uh, which both destroys the possibility of multiple education systems and makes you probably not like maybe your neighbor with a Mitt Romney sign if you have an Obama sign as much as you might like them if you weren't fighting over each other's lives. 
But you also have the possibility of uh, you have the actuality of the government destroying community in, in far more clear ways. So we have a drug war, for example, that has eviscerated inner city black communities in particular, but tons of communities around the globe, including South America and Latin America. Uh, that that's a really bad one. We have some really you know. Just, just straightforward uh, ideas of literally destroying communities in the sense of imminent domain uh, when they decide to take out an entire neighborhood uh, that is a could be a thriving community, but the government decides that the, some people who are now voting over that decide that it's not they're not behaving in the way that they want them to be behaving, so they bulldoze the entire thing. Uh, that happens a disturbingly large amount of time. Uh, uh, disturbing a lot, and uh, and so there's very direct ways that the use of force that, that the government is prohibited or permitted to do that no other entity is allowed to do is is destroying communities in an incredibly pernicious and, and damaging to just the human spirit type of way. So, you know, that's one of my first responses to the atomistic individuals, like because I believe that people, you know, are allowed to put a substance to their body. If they're not hurting anyone else, that means I'm not going to break into their house and uh, put them in a cage because they did that. And that is a destructive community at such a fundamental level that it would be hard to imagine an argument to the contrary. Well, let me see if I can come up with one. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me push back by saying, okay, so a lot of the examples that we have given are of people who have basically different tastes using – the state to enforce their tastes if their tastes are in the majority or whatever way, other way they're able to win in the political process, which doesn't necessarily mean being in the majority and often, in fact, doesn't mean that. But it's it's about forcing your tastes upon others. Mm-hmm. So what kind of music you can listen to, some some education stuff. What you can but, smoke, what you can drink. What you, all, all but stuff. it seems like the response that could be given to this is that's not really what most of politics is about. Most of politics is about kind of two broad categories of things when we're you know doing this large scale kind of social engineering is the first is preventing people from causing harm to others that can't be prevented from just like you know through these voluntary means of just asking them to stop or or whatever else or moving away. So the the really toxic pollution is one example or you know that some people argue that the income inequality that they say results from freeing up markets is another one where it's it's really destructive to a great many people, um, or or in healthcare. You know, like people are being hurt because we don't have laws that require everyone to have access to healthcare, mm-hmm. and so we're not. This isn't about taste. Like everyone would like to have healthcare, mm-hmm. um, and and everyone would like to have access to a whole range of things. Uh, so there's there's that sort of thing um, where, we're, you know, this is, we're stopping hurt. That's what we're doing with politics. Um, but the other one is, is we're stopping people from hurting themselves. So what we're doing is, it's not that we're forcing our tastes upon them. It's that we're saying, look, for whatever reason, weakness of will on your part, poor upbringing, lack of access to whatever resource necessary, you are doing things that are maybe destructive to others, but more importantly, destructive to yourself. And and so we're going to help you, even if by help we mean using violence to stop you. So the philosopher John Stuart Mill, in his book on liberty, he he says basically there's no kind of, no paternalistic exception to liberty. We can't we can't violate someone's right to liberty in order to help them. We can only violate it to stop them from hurting someone else. But he has this exception, which he calls the bridge. It's the bridge exception, where he says, if if someone is walking along a path and we know that the bridge is out right ahead, that there's no way they're going to see that in time, um, we're certain that they would not want to plunge off this down bridge if they knew about it. Um, then in that case we are permitted to yank them out of the way or do something to stop them. Mm-hmm. And so that that seems like a lot of a lot of the things that are done in the political sphere are often we're set we're told are done for those sorts of reasons. So that would be the the soda bans that were recently struck down in 
in New York where Mayor Bloomberg wanted to limit the size of mm. sodas that people could buy because they were consuming too much sugar, sugar, which was harmful to them, which was this sort of paternalism in the sense of these people, if they knew how damaging this sugar was and if they could somehow overcome the, you know, the urge to have lots of sugar, they would thank us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that the, the, that's a very good explanation of, of the honest position. I mean, it's very important that first we don't car caricature our opponents and, and say that they're, you know, blatantly trying to to rule our lives because they're a bunch of Lex Luthers who wanna who just want to do that because they see it's a good time. Uh, they have arguments, <laughs> um, and so you, those are the two. Uh, yeah, you've scoped them out. There's the external harm possibility and the internal harm uh, being harm to yourself. Interestingly, I think that most people agree. So, if we're actually just doing this sort of economic way of which one is worse, so which one? So, we have to compare government solutions to what's happening in the private place. So, when is government making it worse? Is is just one of the, the questions. So, we have the question of pollution, for example, um, causing harm, and. The interesting question is whether or not, uh, you know, does this give – does the harm principle or even the benefit principle give, like, universal jurisdiction over all things, right? Because, like, the first question is, is, is there a principle that we can draw that says, okay, well, like, you know, we're not – that's too low. But if we could show that, like, everyone got the same haircut would produce a ton of benefits or if everyone listened to the same music would produce a ton of benefits – um, or if everyone started driving a single car and we eliminated all preferences and that would produce a ton of benefits. If we could show all that stuff, shouldn't we just do it? And uh, that's sort of like the technocratic argument that we should. We should just get the experts to come in and measure, uh, you know, get some utile, some cost-benefit analysis. Uh, I think that, you know, there's a lot of reasons not to do that. But for the point of this conversation, it's because it's – first of all, it's not done cleanly. And, it, and it, so that's the first thing. Now, when politics enters into the realm of regulating everything as a harm or a benefit that's leaking outside of your zone, um, it's not it, – you have politics and politics is dirty and everyone knows that. So it doesn't do a perfect job. That's one. So there are costs to politics. That's one example. The other reason is because as soon as you start playing that game, um, that is the only game in town and you diminish the possibilities and you diminish community. So – as soon as you, you have no limiting principle on harm and you start saying, well, let's all politicize everything. If you can just show me that's best practices, if you can show me that this is, this is causing a problem, well, then now everything is political. And I, I mean some people might say that's OK. But I'm always interested to ask people, like, when, when is it too far? When has politics gone too far? What do you think people shouldn't vote on? Because there is just an inherent part of a modern liberal democracy Whereas in the response, the proper response to your entire entire neighborhood getting together and voting on what haircut everyone's going to have, is not well. You got to get an interest group and you got to get a lobbying together and you got to get some studies to show what why your haircut is preferable to, to that haircut. The proper response is no. We do not vote about that stuff, and that that is why the spheres of private action are so crucial, uh, because politics is not good at solving those questions. It's not good at addressing them. Um, and that's what that, so that's for the external harm. For the internal harm question, again, it's hard to come up with a principle that would not let me, uh, you know, smoke marijuana, take heroin, but would let me skydive. And, or drink alcohol. Or drink alcohol. Um, and the reason for that is because there is no principle in those as they're formulated right now. Uh, there's just politics. Uh, you know, the reason that alcohol is legal and marijuana is not is not based in some maximum study that we've figured out the total harms and the total cost to individual people. Let's say we're just we're still keeping this to the individual. It's not has anything to do with that, and everyone knows that. So that goes back to the noise question. Like politics does not solve these questions in any rational way, even if it should. Um, we're constantly endangering ourselves, and we have different preferences for how much we would like to engage in risk-free activity and how much pleasure we get out of it. And you know, you can't really aggregate those by voting. Um, some people really are risk takers. Some people aren't risk takers, and that's part of the thousand flowers blooming of a world that respects individuals as individuals and not as their political power of whatever group 
they happen to be a part of. And that's the thing that always gets me. Like, I don't want to live in a world where the skydivers need a lobby next to the bungee jumpers, next to the marijuana smokers, next to the, the big soda lobby. I don't want to live in that world. And it's always funny to me that conservatives will come along and, you know, criticize Michael Bloomberg for his big soda ban and then turn around and support marijuana prohibition or any other drug prohibition. I can't find any principle that would differentiate that except for pure politics, and that's not what we want to be playing, and it's certainly not community-oriented. It, it always when, – when we get charged with being anti-community, I, I confess to often just being baffled by that. Mm-hmm. But when we yeah. get told like that we are – you know, that we, we reject cooperation um, as, as just a, entirely like cooperation out the window, it's mm-hmm. not doesn't good. exist, yeah. Um, or that we reject social ties and all of that. Like I just – Or even was, the better one is what, that, <laughs> that we are libertarians because we want to – you know, be parasites on people and suck them dry. Yeah, like <laughs> these just they don't. I mean, it just totally doesn't match my experience. It doesn't match my values and beliefs or those of the people I know. Um, but I do think that there is there's a a certain sort of rhetoric that gets engaged in a bit by some libertarians that doesn't support this view, but if if not quite understood, makes this view look a bit more plausible. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's this focus on rights when talking about morality. Mm-hmm. So libertarians, libertarianism is a – first, it's a, it's a philosophy of government. It's a philosophy of what's the proper role of the state. Um, but then there's this distinction that gets made between thick and thin mm-hmm. libertarianism. So thin libertarianism says – All that this is about is what the state is permitted to do and not permitted to do. And anything that's not a question so that the state's not permitted to get involved in this, that is just something we're not even going to talk about because that's not what this political philosophy is about. Thick libertarianism says no, that the the moral beliefs that you hold that lead you to political libertarianism, so belief in in respect for people and their rights and the value of freedom, also ought to make you take or lead you to take views on non-political moral matters. Um, and I Such think as that, like private discrimination or something like that, for example. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. And so I think that people who see libertarians as anti-community often don't see this distinction and don't see that, that the thin libertarianism, which is what they often attack, um, is, is just about politics. Mm-hmm. And so I think you should be clear that, you know, we're not, we do not deny that morality is bigger than rights. Mm-hmm. You know that respecting rights does not exhaust the range of your moral duties. You have all of these moral duties beyond that. Or, you know, I pr- tend to take this more Aristotelian approach to morality which says that it's not about like how should I behave, but what kind of person should I be? And so you have these characteristics like being just and being courageous and being kind and beneficent and all these other things and we should we should embrace those values and and live them out in our lives. And so, yeah, respecting rights is part of that. It would be, you know, the, being just would mean respecting rights. But there's other things. We should also be kind and we should also be generous and all these other virtues. And so we, we have to be careful to not make it look like we think that the only guidelines on how we behave towards other people are respecting their basic rights mm-hmm. because then that – that does end up looking like we don't really care about community. Yeah, and I think that that brings up very fascinating questions. Um, so we can say that we think the government should do just a minimal amount of things, but that the people have higher responsibilities than the government. And of course, that's what we do say when we say you know private charity is is a moral responsibility, but not one that the government can effectively or or should enforce. But those questions, they're, they're very difficult questions that arise from that, that libertarians debate internally to ourselves. And some of them, for example, uh, the often mentioned Civil Rights Act debate. So whether or not government should be – and this goes back again to piercing the private sphere, right? The, uh, the And a very sort of – and I mentioned the feminist thing about the thing that happens in the private sphere is not divorced from the public sphere. 
So the Civil Rights Act, based on the theory of, of getting inside and telling private individuals who they can and can't discriminate against, is something that, that libertarians talk about. But you, it is that is entirely dis, it can, consistent viewpoint to say that I believe that the government should not mandate that stuff. Um, but I also believe that people – I firmly believe people should not discriminate based on race and gender and sexual orientation. That is an entirely consistent viewpoint. It's interesting when people take their viewpoints on morality in general. I believe that people should do all of these things that I think are good and therefore I believe that government should make people do all these things that I think are good and not see that those have to be the same level of moral obligation. And I'm not saying I disagree with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I think there's a lot of very good arguments for it. But we have the discussion, which is one of the things that they'll lob criticisms at us, that we, like that we, if we even wonder about and question uh, interfering in private activity, we're off the reservation for, you know, normal political discourse that we even question the Civil Rights Act, never ever bringing up the fact that, you know, you know the fact that they are okay with, you know, throwing people in cages for years and years at a time for private drug use is so totally unacceptable that, that we, we should attack them for that. But aside from that fact, uh, you know, that happens a lot. It happened to Rand Paul. Here's a single thing that I can show your ideology may not believe in. Therefore, uh, your entire ideology is, is corrupt. Uh, that's just a silly way of argument. It shows they're not taking us seriously. But it is – I mean it is a fascinating question, for example, why the government can come in and, and prohibit private discrimination in a business but they can't do it in dating. <laughs> you know, it, it may sound absurd but like, you know, if it's just like some guy's like, well, I don't date black people. Um, it's like, well, that's OK but you have to hire them. I mean – and there have been a lot of legal theories that come up with that for how you pierce the private sphere. But again, going back to it, you can you can think that it's totally and completely morally obligatory to, to behave in some way, but the government doesn't have to make you do it. And you could also think that the voluntary method of doing that makes you more moral than only doing it because of the threat of force. And that brings us back to where we started, which is this distinction between politics and community, that when you recognize that politics, whatever else it is, always has this element of force or the threat of force behind it, then – you can see how you can be opposed to that but very much be in favor of well-functioning communities. And so I think as it, this is going to be a common theme on free thoughts is that these issues that one side or both sides or all sides have very strong opinions on and think are very clear uh, are often – much more complicated and subtle. Yeah. Um, and another but, theme is what we're going to ask questions about things that people think maybe are off the table because uh, they're interesting by themselves. Yeah. <laughs> but, but in this case, we can say that the simplistic view that libertarians, because they believe that the state should be much more limited than it already is, than it, than it is right now, are opposed to society and community is just, it's just an ill-informed and – Absolutely, and that and some of that just comes from the fact that you know we, we always compare um, in a way that that other political ideologies don't tend to. Uh, we 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 say, oh, here's a problem in the market, and and I believe in market imperfection and market failure, and then we compare it to government failure. So one of these things is, well, here are some problems with community. Yes, people can be you know racist and they can do horrible things in community, but we have to compare it to what government does. We always have to compare. Because we do that, we can say, well, I'm very pro-community. I think government is anti-community, and that's why I don't think it should be involved in these situations. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find me on Twitter at A Ross P. That's A R O S S P. And you can find me on Twitter at T C Burris, B U R R U S. And to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.